Smartwatches, fitness trackers, wearables. These devices claim to be able to do a lot of things. They can track your steps, your heart rate and your sleep and quantify your health and wellness. But can you trust the numbers that these devices give you? In this video, I'm gonna find out by delving into the latest scientific research and performing some of my own experiments. Okay, time for some data analysis. To find out whether these wrist-mounted health trackers are as useful as they claim to be. Probably the number most smartwatch users check most often is their step count. In fact, the first ever Fitbit wasn't a watch, but a small device that clipped onto a trouser pocket to count your steps. So, how accurate are the numbers? I'm going to do a controlled experiment to find out. On the treadmill, I'm going to be comparing a few different watches. I own a Fitbit, and I've also managed to buy or borrow a couple of others. An Apple Watch and a Mi Band 6, which is one of the cheapest fitness trackers on the market right now. And you might also be wondering why I'm holding my old phone in my hand. I'll explain that in a second. I'll be comparing the step counts according to the watches to the number recorded by the step counter on my current phone, which is in my pocket. All of these smart devices count steps in essentially the same way. They contain an accelerometer, which is a tiny electronic gizmo that measures, well, acceleration. And then they use an algorithm to identify steps in the messy raw motion data. And that's the reason I've got my old phone in my hand. I'm going to record accelerometer data from there. And if we look at that acceleration data on a graph, you can see that as I walk, my phone records a pretty regular rhythm of accelerations. And if I raise my arm and lower it again, or shake it around, you can see that on the graph too. And that's basically the challenge of a wrist-based step tracker. A step counter attached to your waist gets a pretty clear signal when you're walking, but the end of your arm is much further from the action, and it might move for all kinds of other reasons, which makes the signal harder to make out. So let's try a few different scenarios and see how the watches do. Let's start with a bit of normal walking. In each of these tests, I walked for five minutes and counted my total number of steps. You can see that the accelerometer trace in this case is nice and regular, and after five minutes, all of the devices record a pretty similar number of steps. I actually did 475, and the Apple Watch says 469, the Fitbit gets it exactly right, the Mi Band says 470, and the phone in my pocket is actually the worst performer, overestimating by 14 steps, at a total of 489. Then I wondered what would happen if I was carrying something, so to pick the most extreme case, I thought I'd try a glass of water. This means I needed to hold my hand really still, which you can see on the accelerometer trace. The accelerations measured this time are far smaller. And the results were interesting. I took a total of 472 steps in five minutes, and my phone and my Fitbit were both pretty close. But the Apple Watch and the Mi Band both counted zero. They didn't register a single step. <sighs> didn't spill any. At the other extreme, I tried some silly walking which, now I watch it back, is a bit more like dad dancing. This time I took a total of 525 steps, and the Fitbit, my phone, and worst of all, the Mi Band substantially overcounted. But the Apple Watch got it nearly right, which, given how stupidly I was flailing my arms around, is actually quite impressive. All of this shows us how challenging it is to make a perfect step counting algorithm. You want to count all of the real steps, but none of the movements that aren't. And all of the algorithms are a trade-off between these two things, with different results. The Apple Watch takes this to one extreme. It's so fussy about counting steps that it ended up counting zero when I was holding the glass of water. But that meant it was the only device that was anywhere close with my silly walking. And being a bit fussier can be a good thing in real-world scenarios. Like, I did a test on my Fitbit while I was driving, and having been sat still basically for the last two hours, my watch thinks, wow, I've done almost a thousand steps. So Fitbit's algorithm would rather not miss a step, and they're therefore renowned for overcounting, while Apple's would rather miss a few steps than count a movement that isn't one. And the Mi Band somehow manages to be the worst of both worlds. So watch-based step counters aren't perfect, and the count can differ substantially between brands. Apple users shouldn't fret if their Fitbit-wearing friends are totally outpacing them on daily steps. And it's not obvious which brand is best for you, because it'll depend on the algorithm, how you walk, if you do a lot of driving on bumpy roads, wasn't expecting that one, and probably a lot more besides. 
Another thing these devices are often used for is tracking exercise. So I'm gonna go for the most highly quantified run of my life with these three watches, a phone in each pocket, and I'm gonna see how much data I can collect. In addition to the watches and the phones, I've also got under my T-shirt a Polar H10 chest strap, and this is a very accurate heart rate monitor. It measures your heart rate very precisely by directly monitoring the electrical activity of the heart. And I'm gonna be using this as what scientists call a gold standard, a standard against which we can measure all these other devices and see how they stack up. Okay, Fitbit connected, chest strap, Apple Watch, start the Mi Band, sunglasses, and time to go. To put these various devices through their paces, I mix things up a bit on this run. This red line is my heart rate as measured by the polar chest strap, and this grey area is how many steps I was taking per minute, so you can see roughly how hard I was working. I started off by running normally, then took a break and walked for a bit, then ran some more, took a longer break, and finally went absolutely all out back up the hill to where I started. I was actually surprised by how well all of the watches did here. The Apple Watch here in grey starts out a bit high, but once it finds its stride, it followed my true heart rate pretty closely. The Fitbit in blue has about the same performance throughout the run, but is a bit noisier than the Apple. And the Mi Band in orange is still pretty good, albeit probably the noisiest yet. But basically, they followed my true heart rate pretty closely. The only place where there was genuine differentiation was during my all-out sprint uphill at the very end. According to the ECG, my heart rate peaked at 188 beats per minute. And the Apple Watch did great, recording a maximum of 186 BPM, just too short of the true peak, but the other two watches did rather less well. The Mi Band's heart rate measurement rose very belatedly, missing the peak and topping out at 177 BPM shortly afterwards, and the Fitbit seems to have just checked out entirely, recording a heart rate lower than most of the rest of the run. Apart from that issue at the end of the run, <laughs> this is actually unusually good performance. Sometimes the optical heart rate sensors used in these devices fail to keep up when your heart rate changes suddenly, like at the start of an exercise session or if you're interval training. And sometimes the watch gets your heart rate wildly wrong because it starts counting the rate at which you're taking steps rather than the rate at which your heart is beating. Of course, they didn't do any of this on the run which I recorded for this video, which I guess was just to mess with me. But it does show, though they're not perfect, these measurements can often be pretty good. A lot of watches also track your heart rate throughout the day and night, so I wore my ECG chest strap for a full few days to see how they stack up. Let's take a look at a random Tuesday morning between 9am and noon. This is my heart rate according to the Polar H10, and as you can see it mainly varies in the 60 to 75 beats per minute range, with the odd spike, like here where I went downstairs to pick up the post. Let's start with the Fitbit. This line shows the heart rate it measured, and it does a reasonable job, usually in the right ballpark when I'm not moving too much and capturing most of the spike for my mail run. The Apple Watch is more interesting. Apple's heart rate sensor is, as we've seen during exercise, often super accurate, and apart from a few low readings in the first half of the morning, it does really well here. But what's more striking is just how infrequent the measurements are. The Apple Watch only recorded my heart rate every four minutes on average, versus every eight seconds for the Fitbit. That means that Apple missed this short peak, not due to inaccuracy, but because it didn't even try to measure it. That seems strange, and Apple engineers, if you're watching, perhaps you should encourage the watch to take a heart rate measurement if the user starts moving. The Mi Band seems to be pretty clearly the worst of the bunch here. It only reads the heart rate once per minute, and the measurements are often quite a long way off. There are lots of places where it recorded a heart rate of over 90 or under 50, when it should have been more like 70 BPM. Overnight while you're sleeping is when heart rate tracking works the best, because conditions are ideal. It's dark, so there's not really any ambient light to confuse the sensor, and you're usually lying pretty still, which helps too. And as you can see, the overnight heart rate is pretty good. All three watches are very close to the chest straps measurements, which are shown here in red. The average error is 1.8 BPM for the Apple and Fitbit, and even the Mi Band is only off by an average of 3.4, which isn't too bad. The Apple Watch missed a few short spikes, including this trip to the loo, because it takes measurements so infrequently. And all three watches missed this trough, when my heart rate apparently dropped to a rather incredible 34 beats per minute just before 6am. And I guess this enormous spike at 7am is me being shocked when my alarm went off. 
This huge improvement in accuracy overnight is why some watches will only measure certain quantities while you're asleep. Breathing rate, heart rate variability, and blood oxygenation all require a really clean, consistent signal to get good results. So it's far easier to measure these when you're in bed. So, as we've seen, smartwatches are capable of doing a pretty good job measuring heart rate. But they're not always consistent. Apple's was the most accurate in my tests, but it took the least frequent measurements, leading it to miss things sometimes. The Fitbit was a good compromise during all day tracking, but it's sometimes less accurate while running. And the Mi Band was clearly the worst, but then it was only 30 quid. If you're an athlete and really need accurate heart rate measurements while you're training, a chest strap is significantly better. But having worn one all day and all night a few times, I can tell you that a watch, while less precise, is definitely more comfortable for long-term use. Your smartwatch doesn't just keep tabs on you while you're awake. They can also track your sleep. In the lab, sleep is measured with polysomnography which basically means scientists cover people in a load of different sensors to measure eye movement, heart rate, and brain activity. And this means they don't just detect sleep, but also classify that sleep into stages, known as light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movement, or REM, which is the sleep stage when dreams are most common. So <laughs> how can your watch tell if you're dreaming? Well, it can't. It has to make guesses based on far less direct information your movements, your heart rate, and, well, that's about it. They basically assume that when you're lying fairly still and your heart rate slows down, you're probably asleep, and use clever algorithms whose details aren't public to classify this further into sleep stages. So how do they do? According to a 2019 systematic review, which is where scientists pull together all the research on a particular topic, recent Fitbit models overestimated total time asleep, but only by about 10 minutes, which isn't terrible. Other studies show that this does differ a bit between brands, but they normally get it right to within around half an hour, which again, isn't too bad. There are some weird anomalies. For example, on this night, I woke up and I couldn't get back to sleep, but because I was lying still and trying to drift back off, my watch thought I was falling asleep and waking up repeatedly, when actually I was just awake the whole time. And on this morning, the Apple Watch thought I was still in bed because I plugged it into charge immediately after waking up even though I walked to the other end of my flat in order to do so. However, watches' performance measuring sleep stages is far worse. Until recently, little better than guessing. This one is much harder for me to do experiments on without access to some pretty high-tech lab equipment. And when I did the test for this video, Apple hadn't introduced their new sleep stage algorithm yet, so I can't even compare between brands. However, more recent Fitbits do seem to be continuing to improve, and the new Apple Watch sleep stage functionality is even better, according to some tests. Whether you believe the sleep stages or not, the good news is that all that effort trying to predict them has improved the algorithms at what's probably the most important sleep-based number, the total time spent asleep, which is getting better and better all the time, no matter what brand of watch you use. So, after all those tests, do I trust my smartwatch? Well, they've definitely got their limitations, and I hope that this video has given you a better idea about what those are. Now you know that the step count is probably a bit off, and in which direction may depend on the brand and your daily activities. That the heart rate tracking isn't perfect, especially during exercise, but is pretty good when you're moving less and pretty great overnight. And while time asleep is often quite good, watches can be fooled if you just lie still for a while. But overall, though they're not perfect, I think these numbers can be a useful guide. I think the best use of these trackers, rather than the absolute numbers, is to look at the changes from week to week. If you took fewer steps, spent fewer minutes exercising, or got less sleep than normal one week, you might want to do something about it. Though they'll differ a bit depending on the device and the algorithm it uses, these week to week changes are probably more reliable than our sometimes optimistic memory of how many times we went to the gym or how long we slept in the last few weeks or even months. The biggest issue I have with them is probably that there aren't more tests like the ones in this video. The scientific literature mainly includes older models of watch, because science can be quite slow. <laughs> and even then, it's often pretty difficult for your regular smartwatch buyer to understand all the nerd speak in a scientific paper anyway. And both manufacturers and reviewers tend to focus on features rather than accuracy. Like, it's great if the battery lasts a week or if you can pay for your groceries with your watch, but if the heart rate tracking is much worse than a competing model, isn't that pretty important too? There are a few nerds out there doing comparisons, 
I'm now one of them, apparently. But while these are a good start, they're not enough. This video is an N equals one study of one white dude in his 30s over a few days, nights, and exercise sessions. And honestly, so are most of the other tests on YouTube, which isn't enough to make a truly informed choice. However, I do think these devices are probably accurate enough to be useful. So the next question is, what can you actually do with these numbers? This video is part of my series on wearables, and the next video will be looking into that exact question. How can we use the numbers to optimize our health? But first, if you missed part one, that's a video I made with the brilliant Steve Mould about how these smartwatch heart rate trackers actually work. So if you're wondering how something strapped to your wrist can work out your heart rate using just a flashing green light, then head over to Steve's channel to watch the video. Right, I'm off for a walk.